Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first Gilead Gleanings session. There's Gilead. It's a book. It's a novel, it says, even more specifically. Uh, it was written by Marilyn Robinson, and at First Pres in Hastings, uh, we are inviting people to read it throughout the summer. I don't know if I've given my name yet or not. My name is Damon Heitman. I am one of the pastors at First Pres, and this is a a project that's just kind of came to us as a in the midst of not being able to gather in person and looking for ways as a congregation to stay connected to people and engage people in common conversation and experience uh, an idea of being able to do kind of a virtual book club came up and, and we can maybe talk a little bit more about how we settled on this book in a little bit but for now i want to introduce uh, the folks who are joining in this conversation and let's start uh, let's see how good I am at my alphabet. Let's start with Ann. Hi, um, I'm Ann Fairbanks Bulky, and I'm a retired English professor at Hastings College. And also, back when the larger dinosaurs were extinct, but the smaller ones were still roaming the earth, I taught in high school. <laughs> Very nice. And uh, also joining us is Constance. Hello, I'm Constance Malloy. Um, like Anne, I am a professor emeritus of English um, from Hastings College. And also when the dinosaurs were partially roaming the earth, I did teach high school as well. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> I'm going to go slightly out of alphabetical order here. Jenny? I am Jenny Welsh. I am um, primarily a writing teacher these days, but 14-ish years ago, when I started my teaching career at CCC, I did teach literature. So it's been a while since I've taught a lit class, but um, I'm honored to be here. Very nice. And Greg. And I am Pastor Greg. I'm probably the least qualified person to be sitting on this panel, judging by what I've just heard, uh, but excited to be here and excited to be uh, helping with this virtual book group which is just another way that we're trying to connect as a family of faith during this time of COVID-19. So uh, props as well to Damon for sort of coming up with this idea and moving forward with it. Uh, and I'm excited to hear uh, from what these folks have to say and, and share a little bit about uh, my own impressions of this book from a less literary based perspective. Um, Greg, I think that you and I are definitely the, the low rungs on the ladder, um, <laughs> which is fine by me. <laughs> Um, Wait, so, I wouldn't say that, Damon, because the one thing that I always loved about teaching literature was the give and take, and I'd learned so much from my students and their impressions, um, their questions about literature. So, nice. well, so you're saying there's hope for us? I <laughs> believe so. <laughs> Good deal. <laughs> um, so just a, a brief little summation of Gilead um, if folks haven't yet gotten to it or they're just sort of curious about it um, uh, we can provide some more information as we go along but Gilead is written in the form of a letter from uh, from a father to his son uh, the father is in his 70s is that right yes um, and is writing a letter to a, I believe his seven-year-old son uh, the father is a a minister, a congregationalist minister, um, and is also the, whose, whose own father was a congregational minister and whose grandfather was also a congregationalist minister. It's kind of a reflection on, on his own life and the influence of his parents and, and sort of passing all of this information along to, to his son. So, um, so maybe a way to open is just your kind of initial thoughts and impressions um, of, of Gilead. Anne, I think that's your cue. That's my cue. <laughs> Got it. Okay. <laughs> a, little, a little slow here. Um, well, I, I was, I mean, I, I've been really impressed by this book. This is the first book that I have read in a long time that I came to with no preconceptions. I knew that it was supposed to be a quality book. I mean, you know, Pulitzer Prize 
book written by someone who teaches at the Iowa Writers Workshop. Those, those are pretty good credentials for a book. Um, but otherwise, I didn't know anything about it. So other than, than those things and that it had been chosen by for our church to read as a group. And so I thought, well, you know, this is certainly going to be worth my time. I didn't have a copy of the book. I ordered it from a bookstore in Oregon. It didn't get here until five days ago. And so since I had the time, I, I did go ahead and read it through. I finished that first reading last night, and then I reread the first pages that we're going to be talking about more specifically this morning. And I, I just thoroughly enjoyed it and found it so worth my time. And I mean, it's full of all sorts of human stuff. It's almost too relevant in, in a lot of ways to lots of things that, that are happening right now. Um, and it does have, I mean, all kinds of biblical patterns and theological issues and all that sort of thing. So anyway, I'm so excited to, to be part of this. Yeah. Yeah. Any other initial sort of thoughts, reactions to it? I've owned this book for a long time, and I can tell because I bought it <laughs> secondhand at a thrift store in my mom's hometown, and she's not been with us for a long, long time. <laughs> so I've had it a long time, and I think I bought it because um, Jack Bean, who's a good buddy of mine, um, really raved about it. It was one of his favorite books, so I'm looking forward to getting a chance to talk with him about it. Um, but yeah, I find it a very soothing, in some ways, read. Okay. For me, I've actually read it before, but it's been a while, probably at least a couple years. Um, I need to go back at my book list and see how long ago it was. I belong to two book clubs on a normal basis in pre-COVID life. Um, so I honestly, I don't know if that was for a book club or I did a reading challenge one year by category. And I don't know if this was the book I picked that was the, the Pulitzer Prize winner, I'm not sure. Um, and I, I honestly don't remember much about it. That's not atypical. I don't, I don't remember much about books, honestly, other than I like them a lot. Um, so I'm really enjoying actually rereading and, and re re experiencing this. Nice. Yeah. And I was <clears throat> introduced to the book. Um, it was assigned to me my first year of seminary, actually. Uh, we took a class our first semester and I can't remember the title of the class, but it was something like the life of a pastor or, uh, preparing for parish ministry or something like that. And, um, our professor assigned this book to read. Uh, and I think it actually scared people right out of seminary, some of them, <laughs> thinking they might end up in a small <laughs> rural parish in Iowa, and this is what rural parish life in Iowa might look like, but uh, oh, it didn't no. scare me. <laughs> it uh, it awful, didn't scare me. Awful outcome I know. for life. Right? And who knew I was going to end up in a neighboring state to Iowa, uh, not in a small rural parish, but uh, pastoring alongside Damon, who grew up in a small rural congregational parish in Iowa. Um, and so that, that was when Damon and I started talking about this idea of a churchwide book club, and we were throwing around different titles. Um, I proposed this one, and I think you hadn't heard of it, right, Damon? Correct. Yeah, and so I described it, and he said, well, that sounds like a good book for us to start with if we're going to start a churchwide book club. It's, it's relevant, it's regional, uh, it's Pulitzer Prize winning, and, uh, and I think it is relevant on so many levels. I think a large portion of our congregation uh, are of the age that the, uh, that the main character is and are thinking about the legacy that they want to pass on to their children and grandchildren. And so I think that's a really relevant way to approach it uh, for, for a lot of members of our congregation. It's certainly relevant thinking about being in a church in a small Midwest town um, and, and so I think, I think that we will find a lot of, uh, themes that we can pick up on and, and reflect on that, uh, that are touch points in our lives. And as you said, I think there's a lot of biblical and theological stuff, but not, uh, but in a way that's very approachable and interesting. And so, um, and as a side note, I, I, I haven't read it since 2010, so it's been 10 years and I, I picked it up this week and, and got through about the first half. And, uh, 
thought, hey, maybe some people will be a little bit sympathetic to their pastors after reading this book. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, that's an added bonus. <laughs> um, I, I like the, the it, presenting the novel in the form of a letter, um, I think lends to that accessibility of it, um, that it's, you write letters with the intention of them being understood <laughs> by whoever you're sending it to, right? Um, a letter isn't an academic paper. It's not. It's it's not a sermon. Um, it's a, it's a form of it's a very form of communication that's supposed to be easily understood by whoever's receiving it. Um, and so it feels to me it feels very accessible. And and there are these. Um, and you're talking about the very human stuff, right? That's that gets depictions of very human moments in life that get sort of stated in very sort of plain sort of reminiscing ways. Were there any of those sorts of human stuff things that sort of really caught your attention or jumped out into your mind or? Well, I, um, I really enjoy the um, narrator's sense of humor. I mean, and reminds me a little bit of Pastor Greg and Pastor Damon, you know, the way he, um, it, it, in a very good way, seems to find some some kind of um, humor in, in, in any situation. And okay, and since I, I'm doing this, I'm doing this recording with an iPhone and I, not a computer, and so it's going to be a little hard for me to find an example without setting the phone down and maybe I can't do it. Um, oh, I guess page, page 11, um, not an especially good example, but one I found quickly. Um, when um, the narrator and his father are going to go out and look for the grandfather's grave, um, and his mother said, the narrator tells us she was not at all happy when he said he planned to take me along. He told her it would be educational, and it surely was. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I mean, parents are always saying that about some boring trip you're going to take. Oh, you know, we're going to look at all, at least my parents always were. Oh, we'll see all these historical markers, and, you know, we'll go see the Etruscan sculpture and, and all that kind of stuff. And so when... I saw that the idea that it was going to be educational, I kind of pictured that sort of trip, oh, you know, sort of in, improving, an, an improving experience in, in an old-fashioned kind of academic way. But it certainly was educational in, in a way that um, I probably didn't quite anticipate that it would be that educational. But just all along, and in, in one situation where the the father it's later in the trip is sort of praying for a long time about this 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 and this and the narrator says well yes it was a, a situation that needed praying over it was a long prayer and anyway on and on it reminds me a little bit of Huckleberry Finn in, in, in the way he comes back and, and reflects on things uh, more self-aware than Huck Finn but he definitely does does reflect and I think the letter form really shows that, like, it's it's very, I don't know, not quite stream of conscious, you know, because you think it almost has the pacing of a letter where it takes, you know, if you're writing this out by hand, it takes a little bit longer to tell the stories, but the stories then kind of do this little loop-de-loo from time to time, or we, we mm -hmm. walk this way and then we come back, and um, yep. but I really appreciate, and I don't know, I don't know if that's... Um, a sign of personality, a sign of profession, a sign of his age, but the narrator's, you know, doing this very interesting storytelling that really does go into a lot of these ideas of just talking about his life. But, you know, there is that, I think, Damon, did you say the word legacy? Like the idea of like, he's really trying to think about, I guess, what stories he wants to leave for his son to know. 
right. He's not going to be, or he doesn't anticipate being there to raise his son to manhood. Mm -hmm. And I think it's been important to him, obviously, to have his father and his grandfather's examples and to think about them. And so it's, I often, when I think about literature, I think, okay, what does the character want? And what he wants is to kind of be able to parent his son along in his absence. And he's expecting that maybe this, his son won't read this letter until he's an adult. Um, and mm -hmm. I did the math and the story, the present time of the story is 1956. Um, but then of course he goes back, you know, so it's, there are lots of flashbacks throughout the story. Now, I, I was encouraged though when I, going looking at the novel the second time, the timeline isn't as, it, it could easily be a lot more confusing than it is. I mean, you can tell when the action is happening. Like you'll say, this was in 1880 or, you right. know, now I'm 76 and, you know, then I was 52 or, or something like that. So, um, so, and, and I think that's both realistic and in the way people often talk about their lives. And also it's nice for the reader because, because you can, unlike some novels where you just don't know, you know, what century you're in or, or anything, this is, mm -hmm. this is really um, very nicely clear. Yeah, thinking about, oh, sorry, Greg, if you were gonna. Oh, just the, the, the opening story about the, the trip that he took with his father to find his grandfather's grave. I had a much deeper appreciation for that now that I'm living in the Midwest, having never lived in the Midwest. So reading this in 2010 when I was in seminary, um, there were details in there that were lost on me, like the notion of this little rural cemetery along the side of the road that's overgrown. And, and I, I mean, I drive by those every time I go out in the country. I've done funerals at those cemeteries right. now. Right. Um, and then the radical hospitality shown by the, the woman on the farm mm -hmm. to, to the mm -hmm. father and the son. Um, and how I have experienced that radical hospitality living in the Midwest in ways that I haven't experienced in other parts of the country. Mm -hmm. um, knowing that this was a time, this was probably Dust Bowl era, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. when they were on this epic journey, and that this woman was really willing to share whatever she had with this father and son uh, and take good care of them, despite the fact that she herself was uh, obviously uh, living on the edge. And so I just, I really, really appreciated rereading it this morning and connecting it to my own ministry context, which I've been living in now for three and a half years. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, thinking about, um, I have her down here as Lady in Kansas, but he really wishes he had known her name. I think naming is pretty important in this novel, but he loved her like a mother. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think um, sort of hopping back a little bit to the the idea of what is it that this that the narrator wants to pass along, right, to to his son, and thinking of it from a, from a preacher's perspective. At, at one point, the narrator describes all he's kept all of his sermons um, for all of the years that he's been preaching and they're up in the attic in boxes and he says he has 3,000 pages or some like ridiculous 30,000 pages yeah, or something. I was yeah. Say, it's more than that <laughs> 30,000 pages of sermons that he's kept um, up in the attic but what but he really doesn't he really doesn't care if his son ever reads through any of those sermons. Right. It's almost and, that he doesn't. Yeah. And, and the stories that he is sharing about his own dad and, and like the things that he learned from his own dad and from his grandfather have really nothing to do with any of the sermons that they preached. Um, and so it's like what he really wants to pass along is this, is this letter. Um, and so it's just, and it's, it's interesting <laughs> to think about. And at one point he's, he talks about, and he would look out over the congregation and there, you know, there was like one person that he thought was really listening <laughs> to what he was saying. Um, and so it's, it's interesting, the, the legacies that we inherit from people 
are um, are every bit I think really about the little sometimes the little moments or the the very interpersonal moments the relational sorts of things um, and interactions that we have with people um, and hopefully those things as preachers inform our preaching um, but it's you know it's it's just it was interesting to think about oh yeah he doesn't really want to pass any of those things along to his son he doesn't yeah. Yeah, I think something interesting about his sermon writing is um, the sense of presence. He went through this very long period of loneliness after losing his first wife. Um, and he says about writing the sermons that he felt like he was speaking with someone. He felt like he was in relationship um, and that that was soothing to him and seems to have gotten him through the loneliness. I want to, the, the narrator also seems to have this, um, he's, he's, he's kind of caught between two things, um, it seems. Um, at times he's really sort of anticipating maybe or looking forward to or maybe just wondering about what the next what's next after his death um and then there's these other moments where he, he is just really connected to the world and and what's around him and, and writes about how he'll he'll miss it um i'm just i'm curious if anybody if others sort of notice that interplay between those two things or uh, how other folks saw his, he writes a lot about, there's a, there's a lot about baptizing cats <laughs> uh, and, and the joys that come, the joys that come with existing, I think is kind of how he writes about it a little bit. But. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I certainly noticed that interplay. Um, and and a, a kind of connection, I think, that you can see, um, see the divine in the ordinary. And I think he's, he, he certainly does that just time and time again. Yeah. Or see the divine in, in things that might be, are apparently ordinary, but that, but that actually are not ordinary at all. Yeah, as I'm reading this, and I'm also in the book group that um, Dan Deffenbaugh is leading on Bart Erdman's um, Heaven and Hell, um, I'm thinking, well, there's, you know, it's a really interesting connection between the two. But also, yeah, I've noticed all the moments of real joy he takes out of the smell of the church before the sun comes up when he's out walking or his, if he sees a light on late, he wonders, should he go see if there's something wrong? And then that really beautiful moment when his father's praying at the grandfather's grave and the narrator sees the sun setting as the moon's rising and he hesitates to um, disturb his father's prayer, but he takes his hand and kisses it so that his father will see. And then his father says, I never knew that there would be such beauty here. And it seems he's like relieved, right? Yeah. He's relieved that there's beauty in this graveyard where, where yes. his grandfather is buried. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know what? And, and I think maybe it, this is, I see this as an illusion. There's a, a passage in one of Cather's novels, and I think it's O Pioneers, where the sun is setting behind a plow. And that image is. Um, is, is used pretty often in um, publications about Willa Cather, you know, the light doing these amazing things. And, and I, I have a feeling that our author is um, having a, a little hint there, sort of, sort of aligning, aligning herself a little bit with, with Cather. And I think, I think that's an illusion that a person, you could read the book just fine and not notice that but I think it's, it, it's kind of enriching if, if you do see it, if you're familiar 
with Cather's novel. Yeah, and I, that reminds me, there's, there's a lot of those, there's a whole bunch of scriptural allusions um, to things, as you might expect from a letter written by a minister. Um, and there's a lot, and there's references to um, one of the ones that I looked up because I got curious about it was uh, at one point that they go to his grandfather takes him to a game, a baseball game in Des Moines to see Bud Fowler play baseball. And so I had to look up and see who Bud Fowler was. And so Bud Fowler is the first sort of professional African-American baseball player. Um, and that you could read through there and okay, they went to a baseball game, <laughs> right? Um, but then, okay, no, they went specifically to see Bud Fowler and then you learn a little bit more about grandpa uh, and what grandpa thought was really important. And, uh, and grandpa, I think is a very interesting character. Uh, at one point he's described as um, something to the effect of having having courage and, and no place to direct it or something to that effect in his old age. Uh, are there, what, what characters are sort of jumping out to people? You know, I, I also noticed about that episode about going to see um, Bud Fowler and that's, that's not the part I haven't um, reread that part yet, but I also had not known anything uh, about Mr. Fowler. And so I also, um, you know, just briefly looked him up. And, and, and I thought it was also interesting, and, and, and our narrator does this pretty often, a kind of delayed exposition. He'll get you into a scene. He, he does mention a little bit later in that episode that this was a, I think the term he uses is Negro player. But that's not mentioned until until the end. And and so I think that the the author, I mean, again, she does all these things so gracefully that, that you don't notice how technically, you know, it's it's like the wonderful gymnast who makes it look easy. I, I think she's I think she's definitely that, that kind of writer. Yeah, isn't there a storm that comes up during that game? Something happens. Yeah. 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 yeah I think and there the is a storm. Stops and they and the grandfather thinks it's the heavens <laughs> yeah. having a response. I'm also I'm, I'm going to take a break from talking for a little bit, but <laughs> the the way Anne that you're talking about this also reminds me that there's a lot of. Um, it seems to me a, a really amazing uh, depiction of family dynamics and in particular at maybe I think Midwestern family dynamics um, where there, there, <laughs> there's, there's tensions, um, but we don't really like talk about them a lot. Right. And there's, there's a lots of hidden things. And, yeah. and I think this comes to, even in the writing uh, that there's a little allusion to something and then we kind of move away from it for a little bit. And then a little bit later, you get maybe another little piece of information about it. And, um, and there's, you start to see sort of, there's, there's, some, there's a tension between the father and the grandfather. And, and you kind of start to pick up little hints about it, but also nobody's really going to talk about it. <laughs> um, and so I just, and the writing really, captures the way that that works, I think. Right about the place where we paused, like so right around page 80, um, is where they're having the, the it, so correct me if I'm wrong, because you know, it, it moves around in time, but I think it's his, the narrator's mother and father sort of fighting over where the shirts, what will be done with the shirts that have come from the grandfather and they want like the father tries to bury the shirts and then he digs them back up and then he does something else and then the mother takes them up and she cleans them and she buries it so you're talking about like the child is watching this and going well some something's going on here with these shirts like you know the shirts represent 
a lot of things. Um, and then also that family dynamic of what is dad, who is the son of the man, you know, what is, how is he approaching this? And then what is, what is mom coming in and saying by redirecting? And then he's wondering later, like, you know, are, are the shirts still there? Are they, what, you know, have they decomposed by now? Um, I don't know. There is, there is a lot of family stuff here. Mm -hmm. Jenny, I was really interested in your comment about the role of water here. And I don't know if you saw that I followed up just before. Yeah. We so I, because there's that gun that they disassemble and throw in the river. And that seems to have something to do with the grandfather. But of course, mm -hmm. I haven't finished the novel, so I don't know what. <laughs> yeah. And you had a really great addition to that list. And I had mentioned a couple pages where I noticed water and the importance of water. And then Constance added on to our our list of many other examples. And now that I've started paying more attention, you know, I read probably uh, another like 15 pages last night. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's just water is and cleanliness and washing. And they're so, I did not notice any of that the first time I read this book, quite honestly, but now I can't stop seeing it. It's just all over. And the comment I made um, was maybe it makes sense for someone whose life is a pastor and talking about washing away sin and literally baptizing people and cats. They baptize yes. cats. I that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yep. So that um, you, maybe that makes sense that there would be that connection to his life. Um, but now I see water everywhere in this book. Well, I think you're seeing it everywhere because that's because it is everywhere. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and at some points um, he talks. I don't know if it was him or someone had talked, he had read in a book someplace about water being sort of the, the purest um, representation of, of God in some ways. Um, wish I could remember what that was right now, but. Oh, that was that German philosopher had written Feuerbach, right. or mm -hmm. that guy, mm -hmm. whom also, I mean, I really feeling ignorant here i i don't remember ever having encountered him anywhere before and so i looked him up and he was a, a really important 19th century thinker H had lots of influence yeah um, greg do, have you ever baptized any kittens i have not uh but i i loved that scene with the the his best friend and him because I don't know if his best friend's dad was a pastor, but his best friend went on to become a pastor and then he went on to become a pastor. So here's these kids sort of reenacting what they watch their parents do. And then, and then he goes and asks his dad kind of like, was, was this okay? And his dad's like, well, we need to respect the sacraments, but doesn't really reprimand him. And, and then he reflects on how the cats went on throughout their life and whether there was a difference between the ones that got baptized. And so, yeah, I just, it was, uh, it was a really touching scene um, for me, thinking just about these kids doing what they've observed and, and how important that was to them and how they both went on to become pastors and, and that sort of thing. And I, I appreciated that a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think he notes a couple times the, the glorious feeling of touching an infant's head when you baptize it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, yeah. And the cats, let's see, the first cat was Sparkle or Sprinkle or something, and then they've got a cat named Soapy. Mm -hmm. But one of the cats that he baptized um, became his first wife, Louise's cat. And so they had him during their first marriage. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that that scene, the depiction of them baptizing the kittens, and um, I mean, they're doing it as an expression of love, as a, as an expression of, and he talks about baptism as it's a it's an expression of blessing, um, and he talks about the difference when you are, do something with the intent of blessing uh, than when you do something with just any other intent, and and there's this really interesting connection, the way that that the divine gets sort of expressed, um, I think of it through the mud, right? <clears throat> through the earthly stuff. And it, it just, our conversation just now reminded me on, on page 66, there's a line that I 
uh, just really loved and it was um, any human face is a claim on you because you can't help but understand the singularity of it the courage and loneliness of it um, that there's this there's this sacredness um, to these interpersonal relationships uh, that, that comes through I do have one question because I have technically only been a Presbyterian for three years, I think now, is when we joined the church. And um, on page 65, this I underlined it because to me this was kind of like the sense of humor that Ann was mentioning. And he's talking about the best friend, which in my mind I say, Boston? I don't know how anyone else pronounces that last name. I don't know. Um, yeah. he's, a, he's a staunch Presbyterian as if there were another kind. And that made me chuckle because I'm like, I'm still learning. I don't, I don't know if that's accurate, but it made me laugh. You know, there is some subtle humor about Presbyterians and Baptists and Congregationalists throughout the whole book that, again, I, I've been picking up and appreciating. And uh, <laughs> yeah, and so I think the, the Presbyterians who settled in the Midwest uh, in the 18 and early 1900s were probably pretty staunch folks. Uh, and uh, I don't know, maybe we still have that reputation a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> there, uh, speaking of Presbyterians, uh, there's, so that he's uh, settled in Kansas. Grandfather moves the family from Maine to Kansas, mm -hmm. or at least he himself comes from Maine to Kansas, um, because he's, he's, uh, convicted by the cause of abolition and and feels the need to be a part of that uh, and there were abolitionists hanging around in Kansas and also in that part of Iowa um, my mom grew up in that part of Iowa and uh, and there's a um, there's a reference to John Brown and John Brown was hanging around there training troops and doing that sort of thing um, and and there seems to be this sort of some sort of tension around grandpa was really involved in and i'm at i'm at like page 67 like that's as far as i've gotten right grandpa seems to have really been involved in that movement um and dad i'm not so sure about if the if the tension has something to do with those sorts of things or or grandpa or if the son, if dad never really lived out his convictions in the way that grandpa thought that he should have, or or whatever the case may be. Um, and then later they tell a story about, uh, I'm getting off the, off the track now, but my question, I guess, had to do with, um, and maybe, maybe Greg, this isn't a fair question, what, what would have Presbyterian reactions to the question of, of slavery at that time, Ben, I assume they were mixed reactions. Maybe everybody was all for abolition. Maybe, I mean, no, that's that's a good question. The the Presbyterian Church actually split over the question of slavery. There was a Southern Church and a Northern Church, and then um, yeah. and of course that was in the the mid eighteen hundreds, uh, and and then as the church started its westward expansion, you had uh, Southern frontier pastors and northern frontier pastors and so in Kansas and Iowa and Nebraska you have both southern and northern churches that were planted uh, and the southern churches held on to the notion of segregation a lot longer than the northern churches the northern churches were very active in the abolitionist movement and the southern churches were obviously not um, and so it would depend upon whether uh, Botten was from the southern or the northern church as to whether or not he would have been uh, part of that. Uh, different from, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong here, Damon, the Congregationalists who mostly came from Northern contexts and were mostly abolitionists. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. And John Brown was Congregationalist. Yeah. And so, yep. for example, the small town of Minden had both a Southern and a Northern church in it. And so now there's only one Presbyterian church in Minden called Westminster United, 
because there was a Westminster church and a first Presbyterian church. And once the two churches reunited, which took until 1983, uh, (laughs) those two churches combined and became Westminster (laughs) United. So uh, there's a, there's a really interesting history of that within the Midwest. And we don't know whether Boughton comes from the Southern, Southern stream or the Northern stream. Maybe it'll be revealed to us later on. Yes, we'll see. Um, how about the title of the novel, Gilead? I know that we have a hymn that, you know, there's a balm in Gilead. Um, but, and we have a Gilead, Nebraska, I figured out too. Well, we <laughs> do. And I've driven by it and their welcome sign says there is balm in Gilead. Mm -hmm. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) And our pastors speak to the question of why the, I mean, apparently there is not a Gilead in Iowa. So Robinson selected that name. Yeah. Do do we think perhaps that our narrator is, is seeking a balm at the end of his life? after having spent most of his life in ministry in a town called Gilead. That could be the direction it goes. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. Okay. You know, at one point I, I looked this up <laughs> uh, and it's been a little while ago. Um, cause, Cause I think, you know, from a, from a biblical perspective, what was Gilead, right? Does that something important happen there? Right. Um, well, I looked it up. It was a place where a special medicinal herb grew, mm-hmm. and it was an herb. I mean, it would, it would cure cure everything. And the idea of balm from Gilead is is a, a universal cure. Uh, yep. And there's there's also the idea that the Gilead, the the word Gilead, may mean something like hill of testimony. Hmm. Um, hmm. And this, you know, this father's letter would certainly be certainly be a testimony of, of some sort to his son. Um, are there other, other themes, other things that we're noticing as we read through? Oh, something else that I noticed, we get some references to it early, but there's a lot about baseball in, in this novel, just, you know, here and there and, um, it's kind of it'll it'll be interesting to speculate about you know what what that's doing there i'm looking forward to figuring out the relationship between ames ames and um the child's mother like i don't even know if we know her name by page 80 do we you know, we no don't. Her mother. we don't mother and so I, um, yeah we don't learn her name until like page 200 Okay. Because I was looking for it and I wrote it down. <laughs> you know, obviously their their relationship and their child is the whole reason behind the writing of the story. You know, the whole reason he's writing this letter is to their child before he leaves this earth. But we haven't, we were this far in and we still haven't like really learned about how they came to be together. And obviously there's a big age difference. And so getting to know more of their story is something that I think will be interesting. And again, you all, I've read this before, and I don't remember <laughs> that. So I will be learning along with everybody else. Yeah, you know, I think he notices her when she comes in to the church, yeah. and yeah. she's coming in to get out of the weather, apparently. Something. Yeah, we get these little hints of her personality and their relationship, um, but in a, an interesting way that it, the story unfolds. Yeah, and she seems very serious, and he seems to think that she has some, even though she's uneducated and doesn't have any background in religion, she seems to have possession of some kind of otherworldly knowledge um, that he's really attracted to. But it, And so he's fascinated with her, but it isn't until she asks him to marry her that he realizes he's in love with her. <laughs> she doesn't really even ask. She just says, you should marry me. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a fact. It's a, it's a state of fact. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like she just knows these things. 
Yeah. Well, maybe that's a good uh, a good sort of sort of last question for us. And Jenny, you're saying that's a, something that you're looking forward to uh, right. is is learning a little bit more. Are what else, are, are there other things that folks are looking forward to or, or questions that you have? You wonder. I wonder where this is going. Or I'm really interested in the question of naming in this novel. Obviously, you've got the three John Ameses, three generations of John Ameses. And then Botten's son is named John Ames Botten mm -hmm. or Botten or yeah. however you say it. Um, and then Botten names his first daughter um, Angeline, although he meant to name her Rebecca. And he refers to her as Rebecca. And, you know, logically you would think his son would be also John Ames. I don't know if we ever find out if that's the case or not. But he seems to resent Jack, who's John Ames Bowden. Um, so you wonder if he really would name him that. So, yeah. yeah it's and this idea. Yes, yeah, this idea of names and then to, to compound that with the idea that his wife isn't named until much later in, in the book. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does the son ever get a name, the seven-year-old that we know of? If he did, I, I didn't notice it. So I don't think so. Hmm. But I'll be looking for that as I continue okay. my rereading. All right. <laughs> uh, Greg, are there things that you're looking forward or you're curious about moving forward? You know, for my own personal journey, having read this my first year of seminary and now having been living, serving as a pastor for 10 years, uh, and particularly now as a pastor in the Midwest, I'm I'm excited to to see connections to things that I didn't pick up the first time I read this. And um, Marilyn Robinson, I mean, has a pretty keen eye and understanding for uh, a lot of things, including uh, insight into the life of a pastor. It's it's pretty remarkable. I'm I'm curious about her own background, whether she just is a like a student, a good ob observer of things, or whether she actually spent some time with pastors because. Uh, she she picks up off on, on an awful lot. Mm -hmm. I started to read her novel Housekeeping quite a while back, and I just found it so depressing. I put it down, which I don't usually do with novels. <laughs> so I'm surprised that this one is so um, calming. Yeah. Well, ahead, some, something else that, that I'm going to be interested in, and I hope I'm not giving too much information here, but um, the crazy ancestors, you know, the, like the, the grandfather is one of these, you know, kind of divine lunatics. Um, and if, if you have any nutty people in, in your back, you know, in, in your family background, probably I know I do, and maybe other people, other people do too. It's, it's kind of interesting to, to see how, how they're portrayed. And Damon, I would add also, my mother's family is from Iowa. So I've got, I've also got the, the Iowa thing going on here. And, and, and that's fun for me. Yeah. yeah. I don't wanna, um, if folks have other, burning thoughts that they want to get and I don't I don't want to miss out on them. we only have two more sessions so it's you know time is not limitless here I think it's a good start I think it's a good start in the book and and things to kind of I mean I didn't notice the baseball thing and so now I'm going to pay attention to that as I read and yeah just lots of little things to look for yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious about, uh, at one point he talks, he's describing as, uh, it's like old, old botan, right? And then he says, I use that term old as, as a term of endearment, as a term of, um, this, is, this is a thing that I really value. And then after that, I noticed all, of, there's a whole bunch of other things that he refers to as old. Um, he refers to old soapy at one point in time, I think. Um, and so I'm curious about what other sorts of things he refers to as as old uh, as we continue along. But um, you know, so and that's, think, yeah, and that's oh, I'm sorry, um, I'm jumping right in here. But that referring to things as old, I hadn't thought about that until you mentioned it. But 
A famous narrator in American literature who does that all the time is Holden Caulfield from um, Catcher in the Rye. <laughs> and, you know, and, and I think anybody who writes an, a novel who's an American writer, th things like that, you know, Willa Cather and um, Holden Caulfield, it can't be completely accidental. Well, I think too, Anne, when you were talking about Cather, I know we've talked, I've talked with other book clubs about how in Cather's novels, the land really is one of the characters. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and so then to look at sort of the different, nat like the natural element of water in this, <laughs> how it's the, the role that it seems to be taking with so many different examples in the story, you know, again, is maybe that nod to a certain style or just other other American novelists. I think you're right. Well, I feel as though we could um, talk about this for a good long while. Um, I'm going to draw us to a close for now. I thank um, Anne and Constance and Jenny and Greg for joining in on this. We'll have another one of these in two weeks time. Next week on Thursday, um, July 2nd, uh, we'll have sort of an open Zoom meeting uh, that anybody can hop into and, and share some thoughts and, and feedback, maybe respond to something that we talked about in this or uh, share something that we have completely overlooked. We didn't even, we didn't mention the description of his experience of being a minister during the Spanish flu outbreak. Um, which seems rather relevant to our current day and age. Um, so if folks want to join in on that, uh, they can contact the church and we'll get them the Zoom link to that meeting. And uh, you can also call in to a Zoom meeting. So if you don't have, can't do it on your laptop or smartphone, that's an option as well. So, but we'll, we'll post and share more about that as we go along. So, um, my thanks to everyone uh, for, for joining in and for chatting. And until next time, toodaloo. Okay. Thanks for organizing this. <laughs> thanks, everyone. <laughs>